Yeah. Okay, ladies, relatives. Um, I'm sorry to report that our guest speaker couldn't make it tonight, so I'm your guest speaker, I guess. The young man that was going to come, his name, they call him Tunny. I think he, is he Math, Matthew Cleveland Jr., I think? Anyway, he is a song keeper. He's a young guy. Jeez, he's in his 20s, I think. He's a language keeper. He knows the language pretty good. And he's a song keeper. He knows all those songs. Um, and uh, he was one of my students when he was still in high school. I taught a dual credit class down at the college or at the high school. And he was the best student in the class because he just loves our culture. You know, he just loves our ways and he knows all about them. And I know last night he's a Native American church guy. And he told me he was going to be at a funeral meeting all night last night. I don't know whose funeral, but um, I said, well, will you be too tired? He said, no, I don't ever get tired. But it came up. He had to watch his little boy. So his little boy was sleeping yet. So he didn't want to wake him up. Anyway, he's not here. So you got me. But I'm going to talk about the stories that are in the songs and um, a little bit about, you know, in traditional Indian songs. I mean, I think when we think of native music not you guys because you're all native but a lot of outsiders always think our music is just you know hollering and screaming around and you know john wayne boom 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 oh, 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 you know that karate chop or tomahawk chop crap but in reality our music way back and my mom used to tell us this we used to come over to the powwow a long time ago i was just a little girl and we used to go and mom used to tell me she could tell where the people were from by their regalia and she could tell where the drums were from by their music. So in a traditional way, our music was really uh, also stories and, and lessons and teachings about, you know, how we're to be as uh, tribal people. So, um, I never thought too much about it till later in life here. And I started learning some music because I think I told you girls that I follow the uh, Lakota way. Um, and um, I know Lakota songs and I know what those songs mean and they're all connected to the ceremony that we do. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the different kinds of songs. And that's the way it used to be. There was a song for everything. Hey, there's Velma. If you wanted to court a boyfriend, there was a song for you to either play on. The boys could play on the flute or the girls could sing and, you know, woo your, woo your husband, your new husband or whatever. So those kinds of songs were always around. Um, Tony was going to talk tonight. There's, I don't know how many, maybe Velma knows this, but I think there are five or seven songs that are called the Little Priest Songs. You know, Little Priest was one of our superheroes way back. He was a, a warrior, and he went off to uh, fight the Lakotas for the United States government, actually, him and the Company A Scouts. They went because, and we might think, well, geez, why would they go fight other Indians? But in those days, 1850s, you know, those white guys wanted us locked on the reservation like a concentration camp. So... You know, the guys are saying, you know, we can't hunt, we can't do this, we can't do that. And the government, the army said, well, if you guys help us track down these renegades out west, we'll let you come back and live your life. You know, that's the big mouth promise. It was a lie, but still our um, Omaha and our uh, Winnebago um, warriors said, well, geez, that'd be a better deal than not being able to do anything. They wouldn't let, them, what, let us have guns or anything back in the 1850s. We were locked on the reservation. And if you left, you had to have permission. And unless they shipped you off to boarding school or something, you know, it was hard to uh, make your way. Um, even up until in the 1900s, I know um, there's a story um, that was written by Mike Walker. It was said it, it was every warrior has his own song. And he talked about how it was hard to go to Sioux City even. You had to get permission from the agent superintendent and how long are you gonna be gone? What are you gonna be doing there? And all that kind of stuff. So for our soldiers, our veterans, 
these warriors to say, okay, we'll go, but when we come back, we want to be able to live our life, you know, hunt and do the things we need to do to provide for our family. So the government promised that they could do that if they'd go help them. So little priest and his warriors went with them out west. And these songs, these some of these little priest songs talk about that um, journey, what happened. And one of them I know talks about uh, how little priest and those uh, soldiers got pinned down by the, uh, the other tribe. I think they were Lakota. And they, the soldiers and little priest, they said, we're going to die here. We can't get out of this. And so little priest said, well, let me uh, think a minute. So he he thought and he prayed and uh, he worked his way up the side of a hill, dodging bullets and arrows and stuff. And he went into a cave in the side of this butte. And he went in there and he prayed and he, you know, asked Mauna for help. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And this song that the guy sang, one of the little priest songs, tells that story. And so while he was in there praying, he prayed for guidance. And I guess um, the creator told him, well, you're going to have to shift your shape into a bear and scare these, so these other Indians away. They'll be afraid if they see you. So he prayed and prayed and prayed really hard in there. And he turned into a grizzly bear because he's bear clan, right? And so those other Lakotas were sneaking up the hill on him. They come up to the mouth of the cave and they were hollering at him, come out of there, come out of there. We're going to kill you if you don't come out of there. Well, he knew he was going to get killed whether he came out or not. So he just waited and they said, we're coming in after you. So those warriors ran in there and instead of finding a uh, little priest with wounds from, you know, dodging bullets and whatnot, this grizzly bear stood up and killed them all. And one of them saw that bear and ran back out, the, out of the cave and ran down the hill and told his friends, you know, that, that Winnebago, that Ho-Chunk up there, he's magic. He turned into a bear. We better not go up there. Of course, those other guys are saying, what's the matter with you? You coward. So they ran up there and here little priest as a bear killed all of them, knocked them down, threw them down the hill. So the other warriors who were watching, and this, this song, I guess, tells this story. They took off. They said, well, we've had enough of that. We don't want to fight with a guy who can change himself into a bear. You know, so they ran. And that's how they won that battle. And then the soldiers, the white soldiers went up there to see what was going on. They couldn't believe them. Guys said there was a mato, a bear in there. So they went up there. And looked in there, and they didn't see a bear, but they saw a little priest. He was gravely wounded. <coughs> and he said, you have to take me home. You have to take me back. So they loaded him up on a horse and wrapped him up and best they could, and they headed back here to Winnebago. And they got back here, and his clansmen took him down, and that story goes, and I think it says in that song, too, they buried him in the ground with, uh, and covered him with horse dung. And they prayed for four days and four nights and danced around him and prayed those healing songs. Because we had those songs in those days. There are songs that ask the spirits to heal everything that we could uh, deal with in those days. We didn't know how to deal with the European diseases that they brought, like smallpox and influenza and whatnot. But anything else like cuts and bone breaks and even psychological health, there were songs that helped people. And those, those song keepers, like Tunny, they know those songs. So they could sing them and they danced and sang for a little priest for four days. And every wound on him healed in that horse dung except for one. And I don't remember exactly where that wound was, but that one wound eventually after he came out of there and he tried to go back to normal life and stuff, that one wound got septic and it eventually he died from that. And he got real sick. And we know that his famous last words, you know, I can't do anymore. Please be strong and 
educate my people. And that's where Little Priest Travel College gets its motto and whatnot. But those songs all talk about his exploits. Not only that one where he turned into a bear, but the other ones that he helped with in the Company A Scouts. And uh, Tunney was telling me that I think today there are five that they sing, but he said there used to be more, but people have forgotten those songs. So um, that's another challenge. If you don't have song keepers and if you're not teaching your little guys and you, know, you don't have time to teach that music or learn it, then it's going to get lost. Because you know today people like to listen to Spotify and all their computer stuff and that rap music and I, all that credit music that's on now. I, I don't know how anybody can listen to it. But anyway, all that to say that the old music is beautiful and it tells great stories and sometimes it's healing. It has medicine power in it. Um, every veteran, like if you go to the powwow or whatever and people have a special, I know this to be true, they will um, sing their family song. If it's a veteran special, there's always a family song that goes to that. And it might not be that generation, but maybe like one time um, these young men I asked to come over and sing at my daughter's birthday party uh, over in Whiting in the park, and they sang one of her family songs. And it was from way back, like World War I. And even before that, you know, we've served as Native people, we've served this country since. She's the Civil War. We had soldiers fighting in the Civil War. So one of these songs that they sang for, at my daughter's birthday party was to honor her family. And um, they had that, that song from way back. And I thought that was really beautiful. I didn't understand what it said. I asked them what it was interpreted. And they said it talked about how he, um, he held his ground during a battle and and killed many enemies. And as you know from the stories I've told you in the past, in the Ho-Chunk way, we were warriors. And uh, that was very, very important for us to keep those warrior stories and to maintain that warrior culture. And even to this day, you know, we have that where we really honor and revere our veterans and uh, thank them. And everybody has their own song. I don't want to embarrass Velma. Velma, do you have a song? Does your family have a, a veteran song? Okay. See there? Yeah. Hold on. What's that? Can you hear her? No. doesn't have a song. Oh, you don't have a song? I bet you do somewhere back there, huh? You should have one, your own self. Let's mix you a song. <laughs> yeah. Right now, Carolyn. Oh, okay, let me think. <laughs> I'm gonna pray on that. I'm serious, Velma. You need a song. All yeah. those years you served. Well, I was gonna years. tell you, my my daughter is. Yeah. Uh, she does. Uh, what is the name of that? Uh, Find a grave. Oh yeah. Heard about that. Anyway, she puts, uh, she goes to all the cemeteries around and she puts um, all the names and takes pictures of the um, the stones, you know, the gravestones. And, oh, that's neat. Yeah. And her name is Keisha, Keisha Matt. But um, she's looking into all the, um, the little priest uh, scouts that, that came with him. Oh, yeah. She's trying to find where all their graves are and take pictures of them and. So she said she's having a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, you know what? I looked it up one time on the computer and I thought they were buried here. Are they buried? The, the scouts, are they buried here? In Not, all of them. No, uh -uh. Not all of them. Not all of them. Weren't she some can't of them, find some of them. Weren't, weren't some of them Omaha? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think so there's they're some. They're probably buried in a different place. Oh, yeah. Because. Well, here in Winnebago, I know when I was working at the college, um, or even when David Smith was still alive, he, he had said, he'd wrote an article about there were like seven or eight cemeteries around here. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of, except for the big 
tribal one, the rest are all family private cemeteries. In yeah, Canada. there's a Armel one, and then Baker. There's, a, there's a Catholic one and a Rave Cemetery. Is there a Rave out west there? Yeah, it's right by the next to the Catholic Cemetery. Yeah, and yeah. then there's Baker is out there by where they used to keep the buffalo, I think. Oh, I didn't know about that one. Yeah, there's one. There's nothing marked there. There's just a couple little stones, mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. no names or anything. But um, uh, I can't remember who told me. I think David told me that was the Baker Cemetery. You know, I took a class with that Reuben Snake one time um, yeah. down there. And um, anyway, he at that time, too, I was looking to see where different people were buried. Well, our aunt, um, yeah. Mildred, and um, I asked him about that. And but anyway, he started talking about um, how people a long time ago they buried them on their land, on their own yep. land. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's probably where a lot of them are. You, you mm -hmm. never know. Yeah, and you wouldn't, you know, you'd have to do that radar ground penetrating mm -hmm. stuff to find them. And yeah. oh, Patty. Um, I got word last week. They're sending me the death certificate for Mildred. They found oh, it. Oh, yeah. But Jeez. I don't know. They said they sent her back here, but I checked with funeral and burial, and they don't have record of her being here. Yeah. I asked but, one time, too, a long time ago, and because I didn't even really know where our grandmother's buried, kind of the general area. Yeah. But they said one time that, I mean, they did have records, but that that building burnt down and all the yeah. records in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, geez. A lot of work to do. So yes. anyway, getting back to the veteran songs, a lot of these songs like we hear at the Pow on stuff are these family and veteran songs. Yes. Then we have songs about our uh, heroes and about God. And then there's songs that talk about our gender roles. You know, that you, I guess you could say there's women's songs and men's songs. Now, I don't know in Winnebago about that. But I would guess that there is. There's songs that the women can sing, and they do sing for certain uh, ceremonies or certain times of the year. And then there's songs for the men to, to sing. And each of those songs would describe, if you understood what they were saying, they would describe um, what you're supposed to do as a woman or a mother or a grandmother or whatever. Um, there's thank you songs. And I know... Um, I like that one song that they always sing at the after a meal. I like that. It's it's got a good, you know, and it always says uh, it says something about thank you for uh, feeding us, bringing us to the table. It's a nice song. I like that song. And then of course we have our ceremonial songs, which you would never have heard outside of the ceremony, and they're hard to keep that way because if if the government shut down your ceremonies and you couldn't do your ceremonies, how are you going to save your songs? And um, we have a lot of ceremonial songs in the Lakota, Sundance and Sweat Lodge and stuff. And each of those songs, in depending on where you are in the ceremony, have a purpose and a reason for being sung at that time. Every, every tribe has songs that calls the spirits. And they call them from each direction and, you know, up and the Mother Earth. And they're songs that uh, thanks the spirits. And then they're songs that are dedicated to each set of spirits. So, you know, to learn all those ceremonial songs, you got to be sitting in ceremony from the time you're a little bitty person. So, and a lot of those, I think, today have been lost. And then you can't share those songs outside and like, I was told a long time ago they shouldn't even be put on CD or anything, but how are you going to learn them? You know, if you're not, how you have to learn them, we have to, that's the beauty of the technology now. We can preserve those and, and uh, pass them on, you know, but of course the meaning of them and the real power of them probably gets lost if the ceremony isn't being done, but, you know, we have to be able to preserve them somehow. And I know they don't let us record or you don't want them to record or videotape ceremony. And I understand that. That's a sacred thing and you shouldn't be commercializing it. But somehow or another, we have to learn how we can keep these songs. And then we have these young guys like Tunny and some of the drums around here. 
uh, Helushka and those guys, Bagel Boys, they uh, make songs. And I think that's just beautiful. I love to hear them and they practice and they make songs. And the round dance, you know, the round dance songs used to be, uh, they're um, important to the culture too, because they were traditionally, uh, people came together in round dance, you know, and they sang those songs and it was to create community and peace and harmony. And they're beautiful too. So um, we need to keep that up somehow. This this white man's music or these popular music that comes in, it's gross to me, but you know, what you <laughs> I still like the sixties though, you know, like Crowd yes. Nash and some of them, they're pretty good, but <laughs> our ceremony songs, we got to really work hard to keep them, keep singing. And it's hard. And that, that's when I'm real happy for guys like Tunney and, uh, OC Earth and a lot of those guys that keep that music alive. They're just beautiful. Um, anyway, the music is a story too. And unfortunately, I don't know the language, so it's hard for me to understand exactly what they're saying. I pick up bits and pieces of what they're saying. And a lot of times the music praises God, and I like that. You know, it, 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 thanks God and praises God and the spirits. And that's a good thing. It's a prayer. I got told one time when I was learning songs that they told me that a, a traditional ceremonial song is to prayer twice. And uh, so it's twice as powerful. So I think that's neat. I like that. So all of you out there, I encourage you to get, you know, get a hold of a recording or something and start learning these songs. And they tell a good story. I wish I knew all those little priest songs. That would be so interesting. But anyway, that's about all I have. I could I could sing a, a couple stanzas of Almost Cut My Hair by Three Dog Night if you want. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Are there any questions? I'm sorry Tony didn't make it tonight. I'm kind of a letdown. Questions? Okay, what's it say? That's right. You know, that's one thing you got to give the old white guy knew early on that those songs were very powerful. You know, they were so powerful that they could heal a man uh, who had all these wounds like little priest. And that was everybody. Every tribe had those powerful songs. Um, and if we knew how to sing them, when we're singing them and putting our heart really into them, then they do create healing and they do create power and, and strength for people. So yeah, they, they knew right away that, oh, we got to cut this, you know, snip this in the bud. That's why 1891, the Congress outlawed ceremony too. We couldn't do any ceremony because they knew how powerful that was. Of course, they said, oh, they'll, it'll cause an uprising. Sheesh. They had us all locked in concentration camps. I don't know how we could uprise anything, but, you know, that was the propaganda at the time. I like the little priest story a lot, and I like the clan um, council stories, you know, when, when creator made the count, the clans and why he did it and how he did it, and what they were supposed to do. We still have those responsibilities today. You know, like he put the bear, bear clan in charge of, uh, um, like we call them the police, but I know the kids used to laugh and call them the five the O after Hawaii five O, you know, but, um, and then the Wolf Clan were the social, supposed to be like the social workers, making sure everybody, all the kids, everybody was doing okay, the families. And then, then the Deer Clan, uh, one time in classes, uh, one of my Deer Clan students said, her grandpa used to tell her, don't cry, you're gonna bring a storm because the deer kind of had something to do with the weather. And then the Thunderbird Clan uh, had to do with civil leadership, 
and of course the sky, eagles, pigeons, hawk, they all have their responsibility. And the hawk clan was warrior clan. Um, so when there was gonna be war, they would be, their leadership would step forward to prepare. And so I like those stories about the clan responsibilities. And uh, that trickster story about the nine foot penis, that's not necessarily a Ho-Chunk story, but it was told to me as one long time ago. <laughs> I was like, oh, I can't believe that. I always thought we wouldn't talk about that kind of stuff in the old days, but uh, then Helene Lincoln told, was one told me everything a human condition, there's a story for. It. So, you know, you think about our human condition, we abuse things, we, you know, mess around with each other's wives and husbands and whatnot, and we act nasty. She said there were stories about that, but they were told to teach you something. So, and I like the Red Horn superhero story too, that whole cycle, that's a long, long cycle. And I like that one because, uh, you know, his boys save him, capture his head back. I use that story a lot in my own prayers and thinking. If what? Um, none, no, because we have a clan called the Water Spirit Clan. So it's named after those spirits that live in the water. But sometimes there's description of the water spirit that it looks like um, a Loch Ness monster with a dragon head. I've seen that story uh, told. So, you know, maybe it could be either or, but it's a spirit. So the water spirit plan is... Uh, not necessarily an animal. Oh, and the Thunder Clan, of course, is weather. But then their friend is the eagle. So they, a lot of times, the Thunderbird and the eagle, you know, get kind of conglomerated together. But the Thunderbird, the Thunder Clan is that those storms that come and bring new life to the area rain and lightning and tornadoes and. So that's a thunderclap. You know what I was told this story too, and it's really gonna like in the spring when, when we're coming on tornado season and hail and all that, I was told that if it's gonna come, you go in your house and you close all your shades and make it dark and burn your cedar and pray. Pray that these storms have to come, but they do no harm. And that that calms them people down them, those thunder beings and wind beings, it calms them down. And um, so they don't do any harm to your place. So I've been doing that ever since I moved back here in these parts. I lived out West where there weren't tornadoes. So when I got home, it was like, oh boy, tornado warning. But then when it started building up over here and rolling over the hills where I live over on the East side, I thought, oh, I better burn some cedar and pray. So that's what I do. <laughs> it helps. So far, I haven't been blown away, have I? <laughs> I'm still here. Any other comments? Any what? Oh, healing. Yeah, I, I, we had a request for some healing stories. Maybe some of you know Winnebago healing stories, but I don't know any Ho-Chunk healing stories. I, I need to brush up. But I, I do know, um, like where the jingle dress came from, that's a healing story where uh, grandfather's granddaughter got really, really sick. And um, he prayed and prayed and he went to sleep. He had a dream. And in that dream, the spirits told him to make this dress that made music while it moved. And so he made the dress with those cones and put it on there. And then he put it on his uh, little granddaughter and, and had her get up and dance with her feet real close to Mother Earth so that she could get that healing power from the Mother Earth. And in that, that beautiful sound that the jingles make, then she got well. 
So I know that that song, and I don't know the song, but I know there are songs for the jingle dress. And um, that dress comes from way up north, the Anishinaabes and North Dakota, way north into Canada. That's where that dance style comes from. And my brother, I have a hunka or an adopted brother named Dennis, who's a Nishnabi, and he told me about that. And he said, whenever you make that dress for your little girls, you have to hang it up and you have to smudge it off, of course, which we always do, we smudge off everything. But then you have to feed the dress because it's really alive. And that way that dress will take care of your granddaughter or your daughter or whoever. So we used to do that for my little daughter. She used to dance when she was just three or four. I made her a jingle dress dance. And that's what we did, a, a jingle dress. And that's what we did. And uh, it kept, took care of her for a long time. She's a real good dancer now too. But um, that's, I know that healing story. So that dance is a healing dance. Carolyn. Yeah. Excuse me. Look who's here. Where? <laughs> oh, she can. Right here. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. Call security. <laughs> Call the BIA. Call the BIA. <laughs> Call Dakota County. They're building a new jail. <laughs> I said, yeah, that D Dakota County said, oh, yeah, we can build a new, we'll make more money. Yeah, because they keep locking us up in the federal part of it, you know? charge charge the 85 dollars a day or something like that so heck if they're going to pay that much we might as well stay in the in the what's that place delta up there in the hotel <laughs> oh God, these people what's wrong with them <laughs> oh yeah there are birthday songs those are Almost like the veteran songs, people have have those songs that are especially for uh, birthdays. And I think, I don't know about now, but I know there used to be songs made for new babies and when kids got to growing up, you know, every family had that song keeper, you know, and we lost that along the way. But every, every family, it's kind of like, all of us moms used to have a little lullaby we sang to our kids, right? Well, in the old days, they would make songs for that child, too, probably for their name. You know, once they got their spirit name, then they would make a song for that name. And that would follow them forever. And I know years ago, um, they used to sing those songs at people's funerals and stuff, their special song. So, yeah, they... That's a very, very important part of our culture. It's too bad, you know, it's not more alive than it is. But we can bring it back. You know, I, I'd sing for you, but I sing in Lakota, so, you know, and my Lakota is not all that good. But um, I know what those songs mean, though. We have a song, uh, in ceremony, we have a song like when people fill their pipes, we have a pipe filling song. Have a spirit calling song, spirit leaving song, thank you songs, uh, um, sacrificing songs too, you know, like I'm suffering, I'm sacrificing, help me. You know, that's simply what they say and they're beautiful songs. And you think about it, if you say that, sing it over and over and over, it's kind of like, I suppose it'd be kind of like in church saying the Our Father or the Rosary, you know, those prayers are very powerful if you do them over and over and really focus on them. I like that kind of stuff. I like uh, this traditional music better than like powwow or whatever. Yes, yep. Those are nice too. And every tribe has those, you know, that's what's kind of cool. We, we have served as uh, tribal people, we serve in the highest percentage of any uh, ethnic group in this country. And I can't tell you what that is, I forgot, but it's like, you know, like 30% of our population always serves in the military. And that's um, more than anybody else. 
They say in the whole country, only 1% serves. So we're a huge part of that 1% as Native people to serve. I'm always real proud of that. And everywhere you go in Indian country or anywhere, they always are honoring the veterans and that's nice, that's good, you know. Any other questions? I'm trying to think of another healing, healing ceremony or song. Hmm. Every tribe has them, though. They have those healing songs that ask for certain things, too. The, the song keepers have songs that ask for a certain thing. Like my little grandson had open heart surgery here about a month ago, and, and I asked our society, our Sundance Society in Vermilion, to pray for him. And our medicine man up there had a certain song for just that open heart healing. And that kid, we all were praying for him. We had ceremony for him. And he his surgery was Tuesday and he came home Friday. That quick, he was all, you know, you could just feel those prayers too. You could just feel that, those songs and prayers helping him out. So we got to recapture that because those are very, very powerful, powerful songs. It's kind of like, I don't know if you guys like gospel music or church music, Christmas music. I always think those are powerful music too. They're prayers, you know? And that's what our traditional music was. And it told a story or it told how you should be or what you should do. Um, also, um, there's stories for those people who were the pharmacists in the old days. Usually it was women who were the knew what to, medicines to use. And um, a lot of times that use of that medicine, like for instance, sage or cedar or bitter root or uh, plantain or um, bear root, those, that information for what that medicine could do came to a person and usually a woman in a dream. They had a dream and the song would be sung to them and they would learn that song in their dream. And then when they woke up, you know, they would put themselves in a situation where they could pray and think. And then they would uh, pray this song and then they would go out onto the prairie or into the woods and they would find that medicine. It would be growing there like it was in their dream. So that was very common too in the old day. We had a cure, a root and a cure for everything that we knew in those days. The challenge came when the Europeans came and brought the European diseases. We didn't have any experience with those. Influenza and smallpox, some forms of uh, syphilis and all those other diseases they brought over here, we didn't recognize. And it was hard for us to be prepared and deal with that when we didn't have, we didn't know what medicine was supposed to be used. Now there's a story about when they built the Panama Canal and I don't know, you guys will have to Google that. It's back in the 18, late 1800s. You know, all the engineers and workers that went down there were not native, but there were natives in Panama. And uh, when they went down there, of course they all started dying from malaria, malaria with the mosquitoes. And there wasn't a cure, there wasn't an immunization or anything. And these white guys would see all the tribal people standing along the, you know, construction sites, sitting along the hills, and they really made fun of them. But they noticed they were dropping dead, not the natives. So they finally, you know, saw their way clear to say, what do you guys know that we don't know? Because we're dying from this disease. And the, the tribal guy said, well, we've noticed that, you know, and they kind of would say, why are you so dumb? Why didn't you ask us sooner? And they said, well, how do you keep from dying from malaria? Well, first of all, they protect themselves from the mosquitoes with plant stuff they'd rub on and, you know, 
And then second of all, they said there's a flower that blooms at a certain time of the day and year, and you pick that flower and you eat it. And it keeps you from getting malaria. And I suppose it was quinine, some kind of quinine. Um, but everybody was like, you know, the non-native people were like, oh. <laughs> and then they found, you know, they found what, like when I went to Africa 20 years ago, I had to take these, they called them malaria pills. I don't know what they were, but I had to take them before I went over there. And while I was there, just in case I got bit by a mosquito, I guess. But uh, anyway, until they found out to do that, you know, the tribal people knew how to fight malaria forever. Otherwise we'd all been dead, you know, from the malaria mosquito. So there were a lot of things that tribal people knew and they probably had it, talked about it in a song or a dream. <laughs> but these conquerors just were so arrogant. They were just like, eh, we don't need to ask what's going on, you know? But um, we had cures for everything that we knew, you know, infections, we had medicine for infections, um, lung problems, female problems. I've read a lot of accounts where, you know, the tribes knew how to deal with different female issues. Um, and they also had birth control and, uh, you know, they talk about the morning after pill. We had that already. We had medicine that if a woman, you know, didn't want to be pregnant or it was not going to be good, then she could take a medicine and it would end the pregnancy. So we had all of that. And I, I'm glad to see we're trying to get a lot of that back now. But you gotta watch, you gotta watch your back because those big drug companies, they're just waiting to pounce on that cure and then they're gonna make a lot of money on it. So we have to be real careful about that kind of thing. Same way with our crops. I know a few years ago, Monsanto and the University of Nebraska tried to con our corn growers into giving them their heritage corn so they could uh, do the genetic map of the heritage corn. And of course, we're no dummies anymore. <laughs> So our corn growers, everybody said, no way. Well, why not? We'll pay you, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Then you'll clone it and sell it for millions and millions and millions of dollars. Because the heritage corn matures quickly. It's drought resistant. It's bug resistant. You know, and these corn farmers are just, woo, they would love that. So we were smart, though. We said, no, in Omaha corn farmers too, because they came, the university came in here, oh, we're gonna help you out. Yeah, we've heard that before. So we gotta watch it when we do these kind of, you know, and we might have a incredible healing song. We probably have, actually there's a, there's a plant that cures melanoma, it's called blood root. And it's a very strong narcotic. And the pharmacy companies, found out and got a hold of that. And now that's the same chemical makeup they use to do cure melanoma, your skin cancer, to deal with it. Um, there's um, red willow bark, which is called chanchasha, is acetaminophen, oh no, acetosilic acid, which is what is Bayer aspirin. It's a really good anti-inflammatory with no side effects and so they got that one. So bare aspirin is the same chemical compound as we use our sacred chanchasha, which is uh, a tobacco mix. So all of these things are out there and there's stories about them and people had dreams and saw the plant and knew where it was. And, you know, we have all those stories. All of us in this class need to go out on the hill sometime and just pray and spend about 24 hours and all that information will come back to you. It's in your DNA, you know, that's what they tell us. Any other questions, Eleanor? Okay.
Well, what do you guys think? I'll see if Tony can come next week. I texted him. Let's see what he said. Oh, he didn't answer me back yet. But we could try. And we could, uh, if it's not going to work out, you could send everybody a message, right? Okay. So let's plan to get together next week and I'll get Tunny here or a song keeper of some kind. And then if it's not going to work out, watch for an, El uh, an email from Eleanor. Watch for an Eleanor for email, I almost said. God, Carolyn. So anyway, any other questions? Did you like this little workshop? You have to subscribe and give me a thumbs up. Hey, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering too if I could do, if you want to do another workshop, Eleanor, there's a good one on that I do on uh, Worldview. We can talk about it, yeah. That'd be a nice yes. one to do when the weather gets nicer. Oh, good. Did you guys subscribe? <laughs> Did you, uh, what to call it on my, uh, on my uh, fun, GoFundMe page? Hey. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Hey, that Patty, I hear you laughing. <laughs> huh? I know. I don't get that GoFundMe stuff. I mean, bless people if it works for them, but it sounds weird to me. It helps. It helps sometimes. I don't know. I guess you got to do what you got to do. Well, I've had enough of you guys tonight. Please be careful out there. Please say your prayers. Stay warm. Should show our pillow. Huh? Oh, Carolyn, you want to see um our pillow? Oh um, yeah. Where are our you group, at? our group um did a quilt. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. Yeah. And then we had extra square, so of course Valma made this pillow. Oh Valma, you're so good. I know she is. <laughs> are you selling them or what are you that's doing? That's beautiful. Them? Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, we're gonna have a raffle. Um, oh, okay. Um, is it okay if we show you the quilt? Yeah. Okay, hold on. We have time. I mean, other people might be bored, but too bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they'll like it. Oh, everybody wants to buy raffle tickets, Pat. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and that's pretty. That? Hold on, we'll get it. Do you take Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> hey, pal. PayPal. Yeah, I do PayPal and I just got Venmo. Oh, jeez. Pal taught me how to do the Venmo. Eleanor says, share your information. <laughs> She'll put it on the video. Oh, my gosh, that's beautiful. Can you see it? Yeah. Oh, my goodness, that's good. That's beautiful. You know what? That's a really powerful quilt. Oh. For you know, medicine. And That's beautiful. Okay. That ego. You have to make a story. Oh, yeah, <laughs> we need a story for it. Um, I could do that. Um, what was going to say now? Um, her name is Rachel. She used to work at the hospital. Rachel Atkins. 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 And she yeah. lives in um, New Mexico now. But she, she the made that. that, or is that her design? Um, no, she she bought it. Um, in Montana, kit. yeah, it was a kit. Oh, it, wow, um, yeah, but anyway, it was um, her and Valma, you might know, um, they met, she went down there and they um, they uh, made kits for the for the guild. Each square, you know, like this, they yeah, they cut out the feathers, and here's the spine here, and and oh, then anyway, beautiful. we had to sew them. We everybody had to sew so many squares and we made that and then we had one left so Velma made a pillow. Yeah, that's a medicine quilt there, girls. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll make we... a story for you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But who all made it then? Velma and Patty and who else? Um, well, a bunch of girls in the... Her name was Rachel? 
Yeah, Rachel Atkins is the one that got us the pattern and her and Velma are the ones that made the kits to make each square. Oh, and, all right. Yeah, and it was our guild. Well, who, Tanya, did Tanya make one, mm -hmm. Emma? No, Tanya said she got all the scraps. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Brandy. Did Brandy make one? Um, Brandy did one. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was <laughs> our kids, girls in our guild. Okay. Okay. I'll make up a story for it. It's a okay. healing quilt, medicine quilt. Oh, okay. Yeah, and what, whatever, you know, the feathers mean and all yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Patty, okay. you'll have to get me the information when you guys are raffling. So, oh, yeah. I can put that out there. Yeah, we just um, got it back today. And then, uh, Velma, did you take a picture? We'll take a picture, oh, then we, so oh, okay, we then, yeah, we take a picture and get little packets of raffle tickets, and, yeah. Okay. Well, let's get, get busy on the business end here, girls. <laughs> <laughs> we do bit more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Venmo and get PayPal. On, yeah. <laughs> get on Siouxland's Most Wanted and advertise. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we meet here every Wednesday, um, and uh, but we just came back from like Christmas, over Christmas. We usually don't, um, after Thanksgiving, we quit meeting for a while, and then we, yeah, um, yeah get over Christmas, and then if the weather's too cold or whatever, then we we wait, but um, yeah, yeah, just me and Velma showed up. I don't know where everybody's at, but yeah. Too cold. Yeah. Well you girls, what, all of you students, watch the email for if we're having class Wednesday or not, okay? I'll okay. try to get Tunny or OC or somebody to come in and talk about the music. They'll do a better job than I do. Than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Well, thank you, relatives, for coming. Please be careful out there. And I'll uh, probably see you next week. Go with God. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, sister. Bye, sweet. Bye, Patty. Bye, Velma. Bye, Patty. Bye, Velma. Bye, Janice Stewart. Amanda and Ruth. Bye, Amanda. Bye. See you later. Okay. Be, I hope so. <laughs> <Be careful. sighs>